Hi, welcome to the Global Strategy and Leadership webinar series. This is module one, my name is Chris Thomas, and so now we're going to start straight into the materials about what is in the GSL study guide. Okay, so section 1.5 is the global context of business. All right, and here we're talking about this concept of globalization. We know now that the world is a much more connected place. And because of that, it's opened up a huge amount of opportunities, but also challenges. So quiz, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner had a troubled beginning. The project timeline was exceeded by three years and the delays cost Boeing billions of dollars, which most likely describes a key reason for the issues, A, B, C, or D. Pause the video and have a go. Okay, complex logistics processes. Now, how can you answer that question with only that limited amount of information available? Because it's in the study guide, so you have to have read that part. The, the Boeing example is in there. Not a huge amount of text, but enough to be able to ask a question. Now, the diagram that's in there as well is, uh, is interesting. It shows just how many different places significantly different parts of the plane came from. So, you know, everything from a little trailing edge flaps and inboard flaps coming from uh, Port Melbourne in Australia through to large sections of the fuselage, uh, fuselage from Japan to other wings and fairings from Canada. It's quite amazing, but it did cause its challenges. So I don't know the, the whole story inside out, but I remember reading about parts that came in that weren't to specification. So communication challenges, uh, because the stuff was being all assembled in the US, um, but things came in that didn't, didn't match up. Wiring came in, I think, that didn't fit, the conduit didn't fit through the available size of holes in the frame of the plane. You can't drill those holes bigger. It's the whole structural integrity of the, the frame would then be um, damaged. So they had a huge amount of issues, uh, language barriers, all of these things related to getting supplies and working across the globe. Now, the study guide mentions something about the drivers for this rapid change, this, this idea of uh, globalism, globalization, sorry. Uh, competitive drivers. My example there is Honda. Why? Because when you open up markets, you obviously allow competitors to come in. When the US opened up the motorbike market around, the, I think, the end of the 60s, maybe mid-60s, and then into the 70s, more Japanese manufacturers came in. At first, everyone said they would fail, and they didn't. They took bit by bit of market share, and then really just took over. The opposite happened and Harley-Davidson nearly went bankrupt. Technology, it's, we just forget, it's phenomenal. We click a button on a site, and then that product goes from a warehouse through 3PL uh, logistics, through all the computer systems, it's tracked, it goes on a plane, it goes on a train, it goes on a truck, it goes on a, a van, it goes on the back of a motorbike, and it turns up in my little suburb village in tiny alleyways in, uh, in Spain. And it's come from some other side of the world. And that's just, it's phenomenal. So logistics isn't, sorry, the technology isn't just um, about logistics, but it's also not just about the next one, you know, tech in terms of the phone and the ability to do e-commerce. That's one thing. But don't forget the tech that's changed so much around just getting products from A to B. Now, the social side, yep, that's been a fundamental change, hasn't it? Uh, someone else had to explain to me who this was, but a influencer, Kardashian, I believe. I know the other one because that's a 1980s, 1990s model. Uh, but social and technological obviously link closely together as drivers. Having the tech has enabled us to become social influences and trend followers and whatnot because everything is instant across across the globe. And of course, politically, things around policies, around free trade agreements, uh, around the European Union coming together, you know, that that's happened 
a number of decades ago, but then over that period of time, more open uh, borders, more open trade, that's been critical to globalization uh, having an impact. Now, also in the study guide, they do give the example of JCPenney. Just be aware, and probably uh, should have maybe taken this out in the, the, the edits of the book because they're, they're gone. JCPenney uh, had to file for their chapter 11 and um, they are pretty much going to be bust. It's not a coronavirus thing for them. It's a fundamental change in the market. So yes, they do source products from all over the world like uh, most large retailers. Um, but just so you're aware, they're really not going to be around for much longer. I'm not sure the current status, it takes a while for it to go through, but there doesn't seem to be any recovery that I can see for JCPenney. So benefits and challenges, two videos, two knowledge clips there in the LMS. And just quickly to remind you, some of the key benefits. You can access new markets. You can reduce costs by sending your manufacturing to a lower labor cost country. Much faster communication. You can release your products like an Apple does in every store at pretty much the same time across the world or across the same 24 hours, right? So more equal playing field. But with that, of course, comes challenges. If you open up your markets and you can go somewhere else, you can export to a new market. Fantastic. It also means people can come to your market. And you may have domestic operations and international operations. So you've got to, got to consider that, that globalization means more competition for everybody. Macro and socioeconomic impacts. We've just seen and witnessed a virus start in one area of China and then spread across the whole globe and has caused... 10, 20 year recovery projections for some economies. It is going to be so bad economically, let alone the tragic loss of life. Increased compliance costs. You operate across different boundaries. You've got different ways uh, of even working with local customs and local cultures, and you've got your compliance costs as well. That's why you have things like EU directives and EU standards and whatnot to try and help countries so that if you export to Germany and France, but also Bulgaria and Estonia, you don't have to meet four different standards for your product, which might require different design or different manufacturing. Crazy. So there's also the standardization through the localization as well. Globalization means I can access more markets. They might want, want, yeah, might want more personalized products. All right, just to finish off too on Wes Farmers. Right? This is just, just you practicing reading a case that's telling you someone's opinion about what they think went wrong, an article. But also, if you read anything else, what do you think went, went wrong with them? Okay, well, There's no absolute answer here. We no, haven't been on the inside of the, the boardroom. In for £705 million, out for £1. They abandoned their UK Bunnings home base disaster. Right? It cost them... Uh, probably book, uh, actually, I don't know what the final loss was that they booked, whether it was more than 400. Um, and they did wipe off at the time. They will have clawed some back, about 1.7 billion of shareholder value. Ouch. One of some of the things that maybe uh, didn't go well, Bunnings management was sent to the UK to, in a sense, take over. Uh, and it was a takeover because then they removed, they fired most of the local home base store management, right? and senior execs. So they took over. Bunnings also came with an attitude, we know how to run retail. Homebase is a little bit different. Homebase has a whole lot of homeware products. Homebase has a large um, female customer group that like to go there to buy that sort of stuff. And Bunnings said, no, nah, we're not doing that. We're going to take on B&Q, which essentially are the UK Bunnings. We're going to take them head on. We can do it better. We've nailed it in Australia. We destroyed Masters when they uh, Woolworths tried to get a competitor to Bunnings in Australia. We can do this. Whether it was just confidence or extreme confidence slash arrogance that clouded some of the decision making, it just didn't go down. It didn't go well at all. They changed the stores. They changed the SKUs that the items that were available to purchase. They alienated one customer group that went there to spend money, and by the time things really did, were not working from store to store as they were trying to <clears throat> make more into Bunnings stores as well 
and grow the business. They did remove the Australian management team. They put in a, a person that used to be senior exec or CEO of B&Q, but it was all too late. So you can get strategy wrong. There's some smart people in uh, in West Farmers, in the Bunnings Group and whatnot, but they they got this very wrong. All right, moving on. Biggest section here. 1.6, introduction to leadership. Pre-webinar work was to use the example 1.11 that's in the study guide. Japan Airlines, okay? The crisis that they went through, then the person, Mr. Inamuri, who they got in and how they turned this around. Okay, that's what I wanted you to, to do because you're getting these mini cases here and they will help. Now, before we get to answering a couple of specific questions, leadership theories, there's lots of, le- of stuff on leadership. You can read books and books and books and books. <clears throat> so this study guide is not designed to do more than take some of those theories, try and get them in a concise format um, into a limited number of pages, all right? It's not trying to cover everything about leadership. There are some ones that you should know about, though. Traits and behavioral. So the approach to leadership, the traits approach is simply you're born, you're born to be a leader. The biological basis, your personality, your mental ability, your physical looks even, okay? Many studies have been done around, well, are there traits that make better leaders? And no relationships have been found. But you could also say, disappointingly, um, oh, I can't remember it now, most, the most common CEOs in, I think it might be Fortune 500 companies were called Andrew, white, male, in their 50s. Why? There's absolutely no evidence to, base, to, to back up why so many have ended up being uh, Andrew, white, male, and in their 40s. The behavioral approach. This means nurture, not nature. More employee orientation, less task orientation. About bringing bringing people on a journey. Much more evidence that um, that this is a approach that breeds that that sees successful outcomes. Is also then argued that could be a bit too simplistic, and so there's the contingency approach. Matches a style to the situation. Look, to me, contingency is basically describing what a good leader does. A good leader listens. A good leader keeps their gob shut and listens to what is going on around them before they uh, go away and do some thinking and before that they come back and provide recommendations or directions, whatever it is. So that means they do have to understand the situation. If you just bulldoze in with the same thing all the time, it tends to not to work every time. There is a a clip in the LMS on leadership theories. It is, it's a mixed bag. And we did this because with the new study guide version and the older one, sort of the same issue. There's lots of stuff in there. They're not justified each one having a five minute clip, but we've tried to go, you need to know this, 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 and this. Remember these important ones. So have a look at that in the LMS. Figure 1.13 the Blake and Moulton, is that how you say it, uh, leadership grid. Now, one thing uh, I have had students say they get confused with, which is it's a leadership grid, and then you go down here, and it's like, well, hang on, we're talking about managers, a team manager and obedience manager, all right? So is it management or leadership? And there is a difference between the two. I think in this case, it's actually just a bit of a terminology issue, I don't want you to change the word manager to leader. So it's an impoverished leader. What they're trying to say though, is that you, the types of managers that either have concern for the efficiency and effectiveness, right? Is that they're much more concerned with that than they are about people or often vice versa, right? There's the idea of the person that's in the middle of the road. And there's the idea of the, the perfect person who has both, the drive for what needs to be done, but also is bringing the people on the journey, right? And that that is going to be the most um, effective leader to me. So could you get a question? Absolutely. You'll get a little mini story and then it will say what type of leader 
um, is this equated to? Which of the following is correct about the difference between leadership and management? A, B, or C? Just three options. Pause the video and have a go. Okay, it's B, leaders and communicators of the future state of the organization. Remember, linking back to the vision. And uh, managers, sorry, should have an S, communicate how planning and resourcing will enable it to be achieved. All right, managing the resources. Have a look at uh, the clip that's there. I won't go through what's said in the clip. What I will do is just give you a couple of extra facts that I found quite interesting too. Why good managers is hard to find? Well, because they need to be people that motivate all the team members, the different personalities in the team to engage with the business plan, with the direction, with the vision of senior leader. They create a clear culture of transparency and accountability and being constructive, being effective. They have to overcome adversity, right? Because when you're doing change projects and new strategies, you are always having resources taken away from your team. You are always trying to deliver business as usual and deliver the change plan, right? So they have to have good relationships with their fellow managers at that level, not just trying to appease the leaders or trying to be the popular team manager. They also have to have really good relationships with their fellow managers. And I think people don't realize it until you end up in middle management and then you end up uh, sometimes having the complaint, the complaint coffees, but also other times realizing that you need to get together with that those level of colleagues in order to deliver organization-wide um, projects, all right? But interestingly, Gallup research polls found that only one in 10 people possess all of these traits. Ouch! Companies fail to choose the right candidate with the right traits 82% of the time. Now, you to be careful here because we just talked about the traits theory of leadership and that there isn't no real evidence. They're using the word traits here about the fact um, I should have changed it, but this actually comes directly from the, the research poll, the behaviours. Managers account for 70% of the variance in employee engagement scores. Again, people, if you do employee surveys, oh, we're, ra we're ranking our CEO and our CFO. Not really. You're ranking your direct manager. That's the person, he or she is who you spend most of the time with doing your role. Only 13% of surveyed employees across the world said they were engaged with their work. Double ouch. Okay, in the study guide, there's a little bit <clears throat> on the two opposing views around leadership. And these are that leaders make a difference or it's just the environment that's making the difference. That's how you need to think about it. Environment led, right? Overstated. Look at the table because that's pretty self-explanatory to me. If you look at something like the style determines the success of the strategy, right? Or it's the culture that determines the success or failure. I think with something like this, I have had this question before. I can't see the separation was sort of the, the question that I've received before. Yet there is, a, there is always an interrelationship there. Culture is linked also to leaders and their style of leadership. They help create the culture, but they certainly help direct and mould it a little bit, all right? But what this is trying to say is, look, it's the leader. It's their predictive capacity that helps determine success. It's their values that determine the success because they get the vision right and because people want to go on that cultural journey. And then the, the other argument against is that, look, it's the environment around you. It's actually more about who all these people are, how long they've been here and how they work. It's about the macro environment. It's about what's happening in the industry as to whether it's going to be successful for the company. And I think there are, there are pros and cons both ways. And the classic one, Courtney and I will always talk about is if you take CBA, is it Matt Corman at the moment? It's the CEO of Commonwealth Bank of Australia. If you take the CEO out of Commonwealth Bank of Australia in the next 12 months, will they lose 50% of their profit? Will their revenues drop 10, 20, 30, 70%? Because you just removed the CEO. You didn't replace the CEO. Took them out. All right? The answer most likely is not that much will change. Large organisations, they're complex they are very much, um, I guess, heavily influenced by the environment. So that's 
That's one of the other ways you can think about it. All righty. Which of the following is not a core task in strategic leadership? Going to a specific figure that's in the, the study guide there. A, B, C, or D. Pause and have a go. All righty. Identify the right people. No, it's about identifying the right business model. Right? It's coming from this, giving the core tasks really for any leader. I suppose that's the one thing, strategic leadership, that's, this is leadership. Leaders need to make things happen. They need to set goals, whether they're trying to be strategic leaders or not. Um, as good as this is in giving us something about the tasks, I think the one that, that gives us better information is the elements of strategic leadership. That is then getting more into, I'm not just making things happen and setting goals, I'm trying to convey the bigger picture, articulate to the employees why I want to challenge the status quo. Why do we need to stop or modify the way that we're doing things now? Because as you know, as soon as you do that, you hit your first point of resistance. You hit the, the five stages of grief curve, the denial, the people that say, I don't want to change, we don't need to change, we're fine. All right? So that... They are strategic steps that the leader needs to be able to go through, making decisions in a strategic way, being able to understand. They might be given the external analysis, but they have to be able to, I call it the sniff test, but they have to be able to look through it and see where there's likely to be issues, where assumptions have not been tested properly, right? Absolutely, they've got to be able to give direction. They've got to be able to give consistency. And this one is so important. The most important to me, the whole lot, is the communication side. Okay, so let's link it back now. Pre-webinar work, Japan Airlines. Not the elements because the specific question in the study guide is about the core tasks. Can we pull information out of the case? This is what I pulled out, right? And this is actually not me looking at the answers either. It's fine to go and look at the answer, but please just have a go at the, the case that's there in front of you. You don't need to turn to the back of the book. Core tasks, make things happen. He introduced a management accounting system called Amoeba. For, he, he got it from Kyocera, right? That's something, he put that in. I also read that he empowered people to run their divisions on the idea, the idea of management by all. That was a significant change because we're talking about something that had a quasi-government culture. Okay, goals, directions that shape. He wanted to make employees proud to work at the company. This was, the way I read the case, this was seen to be quite different to the way JL had operated. Yep, he does clearly say that he wanted uh, JL not to go bankrupt. And he said something about wanting there to be a level of competition in the airline industry. It doesn't really give you further information, but I guess you get the impression if a major player comes out and we've just got this problem right now, version's been bought maybe by Bain Capital, but are they going to remain a, a proper competitor to Qantas um, in the near future? Or are we back to one airline which they can set whatever prices they kind of want? Championing the organization's strategy and direction. What sort of things, what sort of actions can you take to, to be seen to be a champion of that? He declined a salary. He exhibited behavior that showed, this is what's in the case, he was desperate the employees saw him as desperate to rebuild the company, proud and, you know, uh, driven and maybe even a bit worried, like he really wanted Japan Airlines to turn around, okay? He wanted to show that they were not going to be this quasi-government uh, culture anymore and that he said people go ahead of shareholders, which is the hell of a thing to say, especially to your shareholders, Making complex decisions, I struggle with this one a bit. No, the direct case evidence around it. Decisions about cultural change, all of those decisions in any company where you're going through change like this are going to be complex. So that's kind of how I link that one. Identifying the right business model. He decided to bring Amoeba in. Maybe there's a risk whether it would work or not, but that's what he did. And um, it obviously seemed to, to work because they became profitable within a couple of years. He was also looking for this bottom-up approach. He wanted to see more people, more empowerment, identify new leaders through it. I think he's probably one of those good leaders that also was saying, I don't want to be here for 10 years. I want to, I want to have moved on, done my bit, but I have to set up change so that the people beneath me that are coming up 
keep going in the right direction. You, no point in turning a company around two years to then have it go back the other way. You could, and we won't do it now, but you could go back just as easily with this question and look at all of these. Again, did he communicate? Yes. Did he have informal drinks? Yes. Did he give direction? He had to do some pretty awful direction at the start in terms of cost cutting and 30% of people going and wage reductions. Was he strategically thinking? Yes. He was thinking about this company is not going to recover if I leave in the quasi semi-government culture, right? Strategic thinking is not just about what's happening in the environment, also about internally. All right. So to segue onto that, there is a section there about strategic thinking, this idea of being able to focus. Being a, it's, it's a hard one. To me, I guess one way of thinking of it is being able to focus in on detail, but be able to see the big picture. A lot of us can focus in on detail. We, we, can get, we can get to this bit in here. The challenge is when you can step back and this is not blurry. So I suppose not the perfect example of the, the image because I actually, you want to be able to show that the other way that you can perhaps, the center cannot be taking up your complete um, uh, field of vision and the outside, the larger picture is now in focus. And that means the broad external environmental changes, things like that. Because companies miss it. That's why we have stories like Blockbuster and others. All right? It is trying to not say it's old is out and new is in. And I think we've all felt this working in organizations where you go, oh, we're going through a change again. We were doing it this way. Now we're being told to change again. But it is about this. It's about ambiguity. Strategic thinking is not easy because you have to accept that you don't know outcomes. And I would say it right now because I've had probably, heck, I don't know, five, six, 7,000 GSL students through our courses. So I've talked to a lot of you. It's not something that many accountants are comfortable with and that's fine. But if you want to get into senior roles and you want to be integrating and implementing st strategy uh concepts and to be going down the path of strategy implementation, you're going to have to get your head around this idea of ambiguity, not black and white, right? No figure. It's not a line in the PL. This is so, so different. What you do need to do, when I see the picture, is bring people on that journey. You've got to get people on the bus. That comes from a particular uh, book, I think. Can't remember which one. But if you think about your organization as a bus or a ship or whatnot, it's you can steer it. It doesn't turn corners very fast. You can't suddenly make it do a U-turn, right? You will just slam into the other side of the street. You have to find your path, but you have to get the people on the bus and you have to keep them on the bus and you have to have one driver. You can't have everyone trying to pull in different directions. That's where it's quite hard. You've got to be able to articulate your position, your direction, and obviously, of course, your vision to your all your stakeholders, to your suppliers, to your buyers, to government, whoever it is that you need to have on board to support the change that you want to do. Have a look at the video. It's probably one of the harder ones, been one of the harder ones for me to make um, that might help to crunch this into uh, a shorter concept for you. Okay, now we need to move on to this next part of leadership around styles. All right, so 1.7 is leadership styles related to learning objective 1.3. Start with the, the, the two main ones. Transactional, pretty straightforward. I dangle the reward or unfortunately I uh, give you the stick, okay? Transformational, it's different. Here's a, a quick story. So this is uh, Richard Tierlink and he came into Harley, I think in the 80s think first as the CFO, before that, then he was the CFO, then he became the CEO. The brief history, and I've mentioned it already with the Japanese, entry of Japanese bike industry into the American market, is that Harley owned everything. 1903 to the 1950s, they pretty much were the only US bike manufacturer, motorbike manufacturer. Then in uh, the 60s, the British and Japanese bike companies entered the market and especially the Japanese and I suppose just Triumph as well from England took market share. They, they just took Harley by surprise and Harley just didn't expect 
because they're quite different bikes. People who actually want to buy them. They were cheaper, they were different, they were less powerful, they were more nimble. You could use them for delivering goods. It was a different approach. They were then bought out, though, Harley, by AMF, right? Don't worry about who they are. But AMF turned it into a production and cost focus. Reduce customization, get costs down. So things just got worse. Management buyout, because the company was in so much trouble and there were passionate people that wanted to save it, they only had 23% market share. And then he comes along in 83, joins the CFO, becomes CEO in 87. But CEO of a company that is in deep trouble. So how does he turn it around? Can he use a transactional style? Maybe, but he didn't. And you would think it would be pretty hard to get that to work for a company uh, with these issues. Three phases in transformational leadership, all right? Stakeholders understand that change is required. I also want you to see from these slides how it links to Cotter's steps of change. I know we'll talk about that later in module six, but they do put it in. They, they make the link here. Uh, in module one. So you need to be aware of it. All right. So the leadership part of it is getting people to get out of the status quo, linking to creating a sense of urgency, also getting a coalition. Harley had that advantage. It's not so hard for Richard because he comes in and the, the company, all the employees know that they're in deep trouble, right? So the urgency is there. He does need to have a voice though in a coalition. So Von Beals and Teerlink became really just a coalition of two. But they took the reins in that sense and they were the ones that were going to drive um, the turnaround. They decided to involve production teams. And this is probably linking a little bit between phase one and two, but that's all right, to work out how to improve quality. Okay, Your, The employees are stakeholders as well. So they're saying, I'm going to get them on the inside and make them take some ownership. Phase two, you've got to communicate some sort of a future. It's linking almost from steps three to six in Cotters. You have to develop the, the vision and you've got to communicate. You've also got to remove obstacles and empower people, right? Or they're not going to get on the bus. And you want to also keep them in a direction and keep positivity and keep momentum and motivation by doing things like creating short-term wins. They put the focus back onto the customer. So they said to the employees, AMF got this wrong. We need to go back to being Harley Davidson, the people that make bikes customized as much as possible to you because it is your midlife crisis, 45 year old male present that you buy for yourself, right? There is a little bit of truth in that. Not that women do ride Harley Davidson's, but if you look at the marketing and whatnot, you will see it. Management empowered production to fix the quality issues. So that, and AMF had got to this point where there were lots of quality issues and to come up with how they were going to improve operations. The focus was taken away from units and you can do that through communication. You just start removing that language. Language is really powerful. Get away from this, how many units are we pumped out to what's our customer satisfaction? Where are those people telling us that they are so in love with their Harley Davidson? And then phase three is this idea of embedding and you're at you're at steps, uh, sorry, I should say eight, not three, seven and eight, consolidating the gains and you're embedding the change into future operations. In the eight, no, late 1980s, they spent eight million on a plant expansion, right? A bit of money back then. And so a fairly big expansion. 97, wow, they'd really turned it around. 200 million on a new plant, right? It's also, it, again, it's a, it's a trigger, it's a... It's a sign to all stakeholders, we've turned it around and we're committed to doing the same things to have the same success. And they continued with their consultative, bottom-up, fluid, in a sense, non-rational approach to developing strategy, all right? Have a look also at the clip, which gives you a bit more around the theory, but hopefully that example um, assists. And of course, we could do another because we've got the pre-work of Japan Airlines. So. What did he do? Phase one was, did he have to do much for, for a sense of urgency? No, it was hard not to see it. The airline had filed for bankruptcy protection. And he had to ter terminate 30% of the workforce and reduce costs across all divisions, right? That's certainly going to get all your stakeholders uh, aware of what's going on. And it's also going to upset people and it's going to make change hard. But there was no choice. The company was in, uh, was in financial distress. Now it's about communicating though. 
So this vision is that employees came before shareholders, that we were going to not be a government uh, at JL, a, a government-driven style of culture, that employees would be made very accountable but contribute directly to the performance of the company. They were not there just to serve their bosses. And if you read more about it, you'll, you'll also find that is a, a, it's a part, maybe it's sometimes an issue in Japanese culture, in business culture, that you're there to really appease hierarchy. It is very hierarchical. Um, so they acted to dismantle that, that government management style. He declined a salary. Yes, I'm repeating stuff that also showed up in the core tasks of leadership. Uh, he was very committed to the change. He was confident about the turnaround, right? And changing the structures and roles and responsibilities. A little bit here and also a little bit in phase three. That's why I've made that point there. Right? There's a bit of overlap there. In phase three, you've got to embed it. So the amoeba style of management helps embed it. You get it in to, to drive change, but also you want it to stay in culturally. They are empowered. They are responsible. You would hope that they, the employees, believe in the amoeba system, and so they'll keep using it, right? And they'll accept that there's more transparency and accountability. But he was trying to do the cultural change to say, you are part of this journey and you are the ones that are making this company profitable, not your bosses in a sense. That's shifting organizations' values. Not an easy thing to do. Values are things that don't change overnight. Quiz, intensity of change. You are the CEO tasked with delivering organizational change that aims to increase multi-skilling across teams and improve innovation outcomes. In relation to Dumphy and Stace's intensity of change model, which of the following is the best management style to use? All right? Maybe give yourself two minutes if you haven't found Dumphy and Stace, control F, PDF, bang, go find it, have a look at it, do the question. All right, pause it, have a go. Okay, it's D. It's a modular transformation and incremental which works with a collaborative or consultative uh, style. We can go and have a look at the little map. So what we can see here is that, that uh, Stace and Dunphy were saying, okay, when an organization is um, going through change and they're fine tuning, there can be a range of things that you, you can do. You can potentially use all of them. If it's really fine, it might be quite directive. When you're trying to go through more inc incremental step change, you're trying to get teams to be more multi-skilled, right? And you're trying to improve innovation outcomes. You're trying to get people to be more innovative. You've got to try to get people to do probably more personal, professional development so they can bring more to the table on projects. Then you've got a bit more modular. An incremental. Are you corporate transformation? Potentially not. You're not, it's not, the question isn't really talking about a turnaround. It's not talking about a really huge inspirational change. It's much more talking around these two, the incremental and the modular. In that, there is a dotted line here. So yeah, it's not black and white, can be a bit task focused, can be developmental, therefore can, could be directive. But I, it's fair to say, more likely consultative and collaborative are styles that will work well with this and therefore for that question, okay? Four styles of leadership, Blanchard, Zagami, and Zagami. Yes, again, you're gonna see another style and think, hang on, we've just looked at a style to do with intensity of change, but now this is the slightly different style. I'm sorry, but that's the way with leadership. So many academics have written so many books um, that you just have to accept there's some different models here. You will probably in the CPA exam question get told to use the Zagami one. When they need to separate them out, you'll get that or you'll see in the options because you'll read the form and go, I know those, even if you go to your index, I know they come from this particular concept. Directing, pretty self-explanatory. Coaching, direct instructions, but with interaction and some collaboration. Supporting, more collaboration, more close coaching, more nurturing, maybe involving people in decision-making process. You would still have the overall decision rights though. Delegating, you're really completely handing it over. You're saying somebody else can take responsibility for the decision. Now, you've also got the one that links the organizational life cycle. 
What's this life cycle? Geez, it looks very similar to the industry life cycle. And it kind of is. What you just need to remember here, the idea of a risk taker is going to be in this early stage. The idea of a caretaker is someone that's not, not perhaps as charismatic. Often risk takers are more charismatic. Often risk takers don't work so well in maturity or shakeout when you need, they call it steadier hand. That's what they're trying to say by caretaker. More of a steady hand. There's still projects to be done and improvements to be made, but that's what it's about. And then you've got surgeons and undertakers. Okay, surgeons are shake out, things are not going well. The company's not necessarily going to be bankrupt, but you may need to cut back on costs. You may need to carve part of your company out, take a product portfolio and sell it off. Companies do that. That's the surgeon. You are unfortunately amputating sometimes and uh, sewing up and making changes to keep that company, not just as an ongoing concern, but to get it to grow again, right? Decline, you've got problems. So uh, sometimes students say, oh, I really don't see the difference between these two. Think of it as not dead, <laughs> things not going well, things quite salvageable, things really not going well, possibility of salvaging the company, but also a good chance that you're looking to sell rather than salvage to grow again or potentially even have to liquidate, okay? Two videos you can watch that will talk about the styles, uh, a transformational leadership, but also we'll talk about the link to the organizational life cycle. Okay, uh, pre-webinar work with Japan Airlines. What style of leadership was in place? If we think about it before Inamori was there, it seemed to be quite a transactional style. Hierarchical, you are there to serve your boss, I, without giving details, you would assume that there are some rewards and then there are some sticks for poor performance. That's what it was. Also, we can see more direct evidence because there was the Enterprise Turnaround Initiative Corporation. That is a tongue twister. They put um, Inamori there, but they tied it to 900 billion yen loan to save the company. Cost cutting had to be done. So maybe he even turned up going, the last thing I want to do is take out 30% of the workforce. But it, there was no choice. They were not going to get the loan. Um, they wanted him in the position, but they expected a transactional leadership at the start to occur. And I guess it did. Then he tried to and successfully utilised more collaborative style, more supporting style to bring employees on the journey. All right. You need to look at the change as a timeline in the sense of at the start, you might have to have a different style. So we go back to that contingency approach to leadership, fit this for the situation. So he needed to be directive at some point, right at the start. You had to remove 30% of the workforce and no doubt you had to do it fairly quickly, right? But when you put an amoeba in place, you might be directing that this is the new MAS, but then you've got to coach and you've got to support people and you've got to convince them that's the thing to use, right? And then once you get it to a certain point, I read from the case that he was trying to delegate and empower people so that they ran their own cost centers, right? And that they felt like they were um, accountable, but also felt satisfied when their work directly impacted the bottom line. Okay, so the continuum, not, not time on this one, but con continuum across directing and delegating should be pretty clear. Authoritarian, right down to much more collaborative on the other side of it. What style of leadership in relation to the organization's life cycle? They're in financial trouble. <clears throat> Were they close to bankrupt? Yes, but I would say he came in as a surgeon. He came in to do change, not to shut down JL. So you could say, you could say, well, I think JL are right near the end of that curve. And there, they, they filed for bankruptcy protection. Yeah, but if you read the case about what Inamura is doing, he's acting like a surgeon. All right. So you could equate it, yes, to the shakeout stage. Okay. Well done, everybody. Now we get up to 1.8, the role of leaders in strategy. Communication. I'll say it so many different times. I've just been in enough organizations, gone through enough change projects. Uh, it's so, so critical. The most important task for the leader. Uh, that picture there, um, I love her because uh, she's a good communicator, but she's also called Roz Brewer and she works, and she is the CEO of Starbucks. And that just cracks me up. 
Brewer Brewing Coffee. Hopefully you get it. I think it's good. So a good communicator. And that it, it's so critical when you're going through change because you've got denial, resistance, anger, bargaining, exploration, all of these human emotions that we go through as managers, senior managers, middle managers, team members, that you have to get people to, to overcome those almost personal hurdles. So how should leaders communicate strategic change, right? Present the information, the current situation, and then what needs to change. What works now? What are the problems? And, and also, especially, what are the future ones? Because that's where you're trying to show urgency. Then you've got to give a clear vision. And then you've also got to, I guess, point out or walk people through their worry about the risks and the challenges. Because people will come to this quickly at the start. We need to change and we have to focus out of the US market and focus more into the Asian market. And people will say, oh, I think that's really that's really risky. How do, how do we know the US market's going okay? They'll get over coronavirus. Um, they probably don't even have all the information in front of them, so you've got to present them the current situation. But you've also got to handle those risks and those challenges. And when people give you good feedback, you also sometimes find ones that you hadn't thought about as a senior leader. All right. Communication is two way. How to assess whether change is occurring or will occur. Are people providing feedback? Have concerns been acknowledged when they do provide feedback? All right. Has past change? It, when you do a change project, you have to realize, especially leaders that come in to do this particular piece of work, that stuff's gone on before, that there are employees that have been there for 10 years. And so you have to not just discount them. It never works a leader comes in and goes, right, so glad to be here. I've been here a few months and this is what we've decided to do. And people initially go, has anybody talked to this guy? Like, where does this come from? All right, you have to talk about the history of the company when you may not have been there because other people have. Is everyone on the same page? Again, it, you can see, yes, it's a bit repetitive, but they're all these concepts are making the same point. Um, the only one thing I would say is a little bit disappointing in the study guide that there is a page on communication, a bit less than a page, and that's it. I swear it's the most important thing. Decision-making. Which of the following statements best describes the convenience style of decision-making? A, B, C, or D? Pause it. Have a go. Okay, a trusted middle management level person can make the decision. That's what Inamori is trying to get to with Japan Airlines, to, to say, I've got these amoeba groups working and they're working well, and they can, to an extent, run themselves. Rational decision-making. You want to decisions to be conscious, explicit, and deliberate. All right? Internally consistent and logical. That means that the data that's been presented and the strategy direction that you're taking the decision that's being made is consistent with that. If the direction is to um, the, the 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 direction is to focus to defend the market and focus on these core products, and the decision you're making is about upping the R and D budget two hundred percent and doing a whole heap of product development, it's not internally consistent with what maybe a higher top down direction that's been given, right? Fully informed. That just means uh, full informed decisions are decisions where you have the information, whether it's data, whether it's qualitative, whether it's the right people in the room that can tell you what you need to know. Aim towards an end goal, a causal relationship between actions and goals. I do get questions about this one. Um, it, to me, it simply means that the decision that you're making will link to other decisions that you have to make in the future. All of these are lined up to get you your goal. And as we've said before, your goals are then lined up to get to, to deliver on your vision. Right? That's where you want the causal relationship. Um, involve choice between alternatives. That's a classic, isn't it? When what goes up to the board or what here is what we've recommended. Um, and a board doesn't want to see nine options, but a board is not making a good decision when there was just one option. They're not really making a decision, are they? Four styles of decision-making. Command, making it without consultation, doing it quickly. Collaborative, provides input. The leader considers the views, but they still make the decision. Consensus, linking to that, supporting, 
style democratic majority rules. Everyone has a voice, but it takes a lot longer to make a decision. And convenience, you delegate, you let others do it. And of course, you see these four words on the left, you go, they're similar to the other words, the Zagami words, and oh, how does this all sort of link? Well, it does. You can reasonably say the directing style of leadership is most likely to involve command style of decision making, right? Through to the delegating style involves convenience style of decision making. Just remember on the left here, leadership styles, decision making styles on the right. So yes, they link. Business ethics, right? The last uh, couple of sections in module one. Anyone know who this is? Uh, his name is Russell Withers. He is the CEO and the chairman. He's the guy that set up 7-Eleven. If you want to see uh, some pretty poor ethical practices, then watch the Four Corners Report. I will always tend to direct people to um, objective media. I'm not saying I'm a massive ABC fan or anything, but Four Corners do very good investigations. And what they uncovered in this was pretty unethical, just plain poor, poor behavior. Uh, and then, of course, it goes through to when they got Adam, um, Alan Fells as a ex-chairman of the Competition Consumer Commission to come and do a review. And then they sacked him because they didn't like what he was saying, which was, you guys knew about this the whole time. This is about the underpayment scandal that was going on. All right. But 7-Eleven uh, had mentioned the study guide. That's why I put it up in the slides. Classical view of ethics. Provide maximum value to shareholders. You increase profits through open and I suppose you say fair competition meeting legislative requirements. Okay. That was Friedman, Milton Friedman. Then you have the socioeconomic view of ethics, which was Freeman, similar names, but they had completely different views on this. And that is that you have responsibility to society. And we are starting to see this. Classical view of ethics is Facebook right now. What are we trying to say, or governments are trying to say to Facebook, and maybe some users are slowly trying to say is, you need to move to a more socioeconomic view of, of ethics. You are just, and this is very typical of an American company, not really having a go at Facebook for this because it's, it is part of the culture. You return as much value as you can to shareholders. That is your sole purpose, all right? But, you know, when you see something like a BHP Billiton defending using a marketing hub to minimize tax, is it ethical? It's not about whether it's legal or not. Is it ethical, all right? The same thing with um, the common sure scandal. Now, Commonwealth Bank, and they've all been through scandals. This one's a bit older. It's going back to 2016. But, yeah, I still leave it up there because it's just so shocking how they went out of their way not to pay any claims out that they could get away with, right? To not deliver on the product that they've been selling to people on the value proposition. Ethics and strategy implementation. Of course, you're deciding and talking with your leaders and your staff and everyone, how we're going to get there. And you're communicating and articulating that. But then it's a matter of what ethics and values will guide us. You can use, you can use that relationship between the values of your organization. You can review those values up front. Are they values that promote ethical behavior? They better, if they don't, that value probably needs to be scrubbed and a new one needs to be uh, created in its place, right? But that it's, it's strategic thinking again. Are we doing this in an ethical manner? What are our minimum expectations on methods and behavior of our employees? Also, behavior of our suppliers, behavior of our customers, okay? Ethically, how our customers might use the products. I suppose you could, um, off the top of my head, link this back to a gun manufacturer, maybe. Probably going down a rabbit hole that I don't want to. But even that, it's, it's an extreme example, but what's the minimum expectation on the methods, the behaviors of how we sell guns, how we make guns, what guns are used for. People make guns for farmers to shoot feral cats, right? I'm not at all getting down gun control path, but just think about that as an example of a company that has to consider it. All companies have to consider this and it's what doesn't happen enough. You know this, you've talked it through with Courtney in ethics and governance, it's a subject you first do. 
But have a look at 7-Eleven and then have a look at a better example. It's nice to see something a bit more positive with cotton on. Both in the study guide, therefore you can get a question on either. All right. Finally, 1.9, the role of a CPA in strategy. Basically, I'm, I'm just breaking out the table here for you. So I'm going to do it pretty quickly. You need to go to this table. You need to understand the different, it's the same categories in the red here. If it's an accountant, how are they likely to be involved? This is a lower level, uh, a lower level position, external and internal analysis, gathering data, developing a plan, supporting modeling, right? Probably not writing it all up and having to do horrible PowerPoint or something at that stage. Implementing the plan, sure. Things like analyzing performance, running the reports, finding uh, areas that need to go to your manager to be then challenged in team meetings about what might be off track or on track, right? Reviewing, evaluating, gathering information again. But as we rise, there's an expectation of more complexity and then an expectation of more strategic complexity and then an expectation of more strategic thinking. That's the point of this table. So you're now more about analysis as the senior accountant, more of an active role in business modeling rather than just um, perhaps ins ensuring that it occurs or gathering data for the business model, analyzing performance. Let's go up one. Your financial controller is a much more senior position. You need to, you see words now like conceptualize. Right. Words like conceptualize, right? That the reason is you've got to now think about business models. You don't really expect to think about that as, um, as an accountant, as a financial controller, you are. You're in different meetings that are talking about that stuff. You're in meetings that are all around planning for contingencies and risks, right? Meetings that are about the higher level scoping, okay? And of course, you go up to the CFO, which you really do CFO slash CEO position. You are leading decision-making processes. You may not be making the decisions, but you're ensuring that good rational decision-making processes are in place. You're understanding implications from what's going on. You understand the risk management. You don't have to do the risk profile. The risk team does it, but you're the one that's going to present it to the board, right? And they are, I've done them. They are more, the more uncomfortable board meetings to go to when you're talking about risk. You got to lead change. You got to lead communication. You got to identify issues, but the strategic, the big ones. All right. There is a video uh, talking about that more from I think well, it's a bit of an old one. I think from my personal experience actually, um, but that might help in a couple of minutes uh, round out that bit. All right. So what have we done in module one? Well, we've looked at an overview of what strategy is about. It's more than just the art of getting involved in war. It's come a long way from that. Then we linked it to the organizational context, didn't we? We did that through the idea of things like approaches to strategy, levels of strategy, strategic fit or stretch. So this is a larger section than something like globalization or this last one here, right? If we, if we did a weighting in between the module, you would weight this one with more. We did that. We looked at globalization. Briefly, but there's also two good videos there running through. And we thought about it, the drivers of globalization, right? The videos will give you more specific details on benefits and challenges. Then we got our teeth into leadership and strategy. And we realized that there's a lot of concepts, but sorry, guys, you just got to wrap them up and chew on them for a bit. Uh, you can spit them out at the end after you've done your exam, but you just have to accept that you need to understand traits and behavioral. You need to understand transactional, transformational, and there's differences between them. You need to understand that there's decision-making styles, right? But there's Zagami ones, and then there's other ones around intensity of change model, which is a specific model, and you'll need to be able to find that in your index. And then finally, we looked at the CPA role in strategy, which is a shorter bit, but of course, easy for them, CPA, uh, being them to ask a question based on that table. All right, fantastic effort. It's early in the semester. You have got your way through module one, right? You're using the LMS materials. Once you are comfortable with module one, do the module quiz then. Do at least the first of the two module quizzes. Don't wait till week nine. It is not good study technique. Do it after you've covered that material. All right, fantastic. Thanks for being with me. Thanks for watching this webinar. And I will see you again soon for module two. Bye for now.